Father, if we have our theology right, then we know what your Son said, Jesus Christ, that apart from him, we can do nothing. So this sermon has no chance apart from you. We as listeners have no chance apart from you. Lord, we depend on you to breathe and think. Uh, the blood flowing through our bodies even now, it's all, it's all dependent, 100% dependent upon you. And so right now, this time, to be anything of any real fruitfulness and grace from God, it's, it's dependent upon you. So even now, Lord, forgive us for when we think we can do things, when we think that we're in control or not. But forgive us, but then cleanse us and help us to see. Oh, Lord, I pray. I pray there be a supernatural, powerful sense of encouragement through this place this day. The truth that we're going to hear, Lord, the truth of being new in Christ, the truth of understanding what we truly live for. Oh, Lord, would you work and would you move? Even now, I pray the hearts of your people are saying amen in their hearts. They are desiring for this to be an encounter with you. You will speak and that you will transform. Again, apart from you, we can do nothing. So we seek you now. I pray together as a church. In Jesus' name, amen? Amen. Hey, um, welcome. If you're uh, visiting with us today or you're new, special welcome to you too. So glad uh, that you are, that you would sense the love of God and the encouragement of God here in the Spirit uh, as well. And just before we get into God's Word, two quick announcements I want to uh, take my turn at. Uh, the first one is this. Um, we have a live webcast coming up with Daniel Henderson, good friend of ours at the church. Love Daniel. Spoke here last year. Um, we've gone through his book, Transforming Prayer, as small groups, really being used of God. He's again a live webcast next Saturday. Um, there's three main sessions. He wrote a book called The Deeper Life. And so maybe some of you are here and your New Year's resolution, whether written down or just unofficially, is, man, I want to become more like Jesus Christ. This then is sent for you. Um, this is the way that this happens, as, as my soul's longing for more. This is what he's going to be speaking on. He's a trusted, we trust him and how God uh, speaks to him. And so uh, the cost Saturday is $10 only because it's going to be um, lunch. Okay, so you get lunch. And, um, and get together for that. And Daniel is also speaking at this. Daniel's one of our speakers for Free Indeed. This is our men's conference, third year. We've done this uh, here. I bring this to your attention right now, February 5th and 6th, because we are um, at, we are uh, registration-wise, at uh, this time last year, last year sold out, okay? So what men tend to do is they men to procrastinate, all right? And they like to wait to the last moment to do certain things. Like, oh, I'm going to show up on the 5th and sign up, and uh, you, you probably won't get in if that happens. So I'm going to do the 4th then, okay? Probably won't won't get in then either. The third? No, no, no. I don't know. So we're going to see what happens. A lot of people are coming. Um, registration so far, several hundred men. I'm excited. 25% of the registration is non-harvest, like no harvest church at all um, are coming. So the word's getting out. There's real momentum for this. So all that to say, men, if you're planning on coming, I would encourage you to sign up in the next couple weeks for sure. And why not just do it this week? No, 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 I'll wait till the end. All right, well, it'll be a sad day if you don't get in, all right? It'll be sad. I'll be sad as you're standing on the door knocking on it. We're like, I'm sorry, there's no room. There's no room, all right? That'll be sad, okay? So let's not be sad. Let's be happy, and let's, and let's sign up soon. And ladies, you can help us with that, okay? You can give just gentle, g- gentle nudges and encouragement along the way to seeing how God will use this conference. He's used it each year very powerfully. We're really uh, anticipating that to happen again. All right, 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 is where we are today, and if you don't have a Bible, please find one. If you don't have a Bible with you, you can find one in the seat in front of you, and you can uh, search the table of contents to find out where 2 Corinthians 5 is, or maybe someone next to you can help you find out where 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5 is. I, I love that we have people that have been in the faith for a while. We have people who are brand new to the faith um, as well, or not even in the faith yet, searching and seeking, and we welcome all here. But God's Word is what changes our lives. I have no message apart from God's Word. So that's why we open up the book. That's why we bring a Bible with us to church. That's why we read it each day. It is a living, supernatural, uh, God-inspired book that changes um, our lives. And as we turn to 2 Corinthians 5, we begin the series um, called Made New. Made New. The gospel um, according to the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. So let me ask you a question. Um, the question is this. Do you like new? Do you like new? If you're human, you probably do on some level. Because our world loves new. Our world, um, in many ways, is obsessed with new. We think about um, new clothes and uh, new cars 
uh, new homes, new uh, gadgets, new handheld devices, new smartphones, new games, new hobbies, um, new food. We like new food. Old food tends to be pretty stinky and bad, right? We like new food. Um, call me weird. I like this. I like, um, I like new paint. Now, what I mean by that is I love a fresh coat of paint, you know? So in our house right now, we've got baseboards and wall trim, and you've got four young kids running around playing all sorts of sports and activities and, and kind of wrecking up the house a little bit. Well, you look at the trim, and I notice these kind of things, smudges, dirt, scratches, you know, seemingly you just kind of painted it, but the problem with something new, you get enough time, it starts to look old. Yes, yes. So I was like, hey, 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 hon, can we get some trim bake? I want to I wanna do it because you put on a fresh coat of paint, and it looks like... New, right? And doesn't that excite you? Anyone else? Anyone else? I think it's exciting to see that. Even in our church, in certain areas, we're just beating this building up, but a fresh coat of paint, you're just like, yeah, that just feels good because we love new. But it goes on. Inherently, we love new seasons and new days and new opportunities and new uh, health. When we've recovered from something, we feel uh, new again. We feel strong. We love a new lease on life, right? All these things that excite us, they all kind of centered in on new. Now, I get it. I get it. I get it. We love new. The reason that I get it is because I think inherently we have been created by our creator to love new. There's something in us that longs for newness, that longs for what is pure and beautiful and right. We do love new, and that is uh, so good. And in some ways, um, new just doesn't get old, does it? And yet, in some ways, new does get old when it's seen through the lens of our world. Here's where new gets old. New gets old when, again, give something enough time, and that new becomes old. So then what happens is we have an obsession for the next new, for the new new, if you could put it that way. I mean, just take any kind of stream of inventions. Look at the iPhone, right? And the first iPhone came out, whoa! And then there's what, two and two, I can't remember anymore, maybe two S and three S, S this, and, and then like I saw recently someone had an iPhone 4, and they were looked down on like they were second-class citizen. You know what I mean? iPhone 4, iPhone 4. I don't have the latest one, but I don't have iPhone 4. This is probably, I felt almost bad. Cause they, why? Because they didn't have the new new. They didn't have the next new. So it's the new new and the next new that drives us. And you can do your own calculations in your mind to see how much you are thinking about what's new next that drives you to get that next new. But I'm going somewhere with this, okay? I'm going somewhere with this. What if, though, what if, and this is where this series is so glorious and so exciting, what if there was a new that never actually got old, like ever? What if there was a new that actually got newer as time went on? What if there was a new, as time went on, increased in glory, increased in strength, increased in beauty, and increased in value? What if there was a new that was so new and so awesome, it conquered any form of old. What if there was a new that exceeded the value of all the riches on all the earth, totally combined? There is a new like that. And the new that I just described to you, this new is found only in the gospel of Jesus Christ. This is a new, and we are made new by the gospel. On the outside, we're aging. On the inside, we're being renewed. And we are headed towards the time where we will see full, perfected glory and strength and beauty and the presence of our God Almighty. That's why 2 Corinthians 5 was written. God is unpacking his version of new. And he's like, hey, world, do you think you got new? I'll show you new. I'll show you a new that never, ever gets old. Our theme verse for this chapter is verse 17. Check it out. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 17. This is, the, this is the miracle of being saved by grace through faith in Jesus Christ. If anyone is in Christ, saved in Christ, Christ lives in you. Notice, he is a what? He is a new creation or a new creature you literally are brought from death to life it says the old has gone the old has passed away and behold this is so great and behold the tell me tell me the 
new, the new has come. To be made new in Jesus Christ is to be in a place that you will never, ever get old truly. Outside, yes. Inside, no. So hear this, okay? Here's some good theology. Every person ever born has been created, has been born physically. Every person has come from the womb of their mother. They were born physically. Only certain people have been born spiritually. God is the one who causes someone to be born again spiritually. And when you are spiritually reborn through faith and the life of Jesus Christ, that is when you will never die again. When God creates something new spiritually, old can't even get a foot in the door. So much to say about this, but that's why we take four weeks to do it. They knew the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Now, some of you are like, what's up with the icons behind you? All right, so the icons are four of them. We have four messages in this series, Lord willing, four messages, and each represent some way that we've been made new. Week number one, we're going to learn this right now. To be made new means we have a new body. That's a tent. The tent is going to describe our earthly body. This, this is a tent, okay? This tent is not here forever, man. There's this new resurrection body that's coming, and we're going to be seeing the tent replaced and the resurrection body coming, all in favor of perfect resurrection bodies, all in favor. Oh, yeah, that's going to be a great day, okay? So that's week number one. We have a new body. Week number two, we have new vision. The text says walk by faith and not by sight. To be made new in Christ means we see differently. We're not looking at the world now. We see with eyes of faith. We see the glory that awaits. We understand what it is and who it is we're living for. New body, new vision, heart, new love. When Jesus Christ changes us and saves us, there's a new love that enters into our life. A love for him, a love for one another, a love that is of the Lord, supernatural from the heavens. So we have new body, new vision, new heart. And then the last one, that beautiful little sprout of creation. That's our theme verse. That's our text, new creation. To be made new means that you are a new creature. You are a new creation. And this is what we're going to do within this series. So, so an introduction to the series as a whole. Need to do that. Get on the same page. And now a little introduction into the message today. And this is uh, very brief, but what's amazing about this new, okay, that's what I love. When we are made new, what we learn today, if you are truly saved in Christ, this is one of the great kind of tests. Where am I? Where am I? If you're made new, ready? You will groan. What do you mean? Well, we're going to find out from the God's word specifically in just a moment. But let me just give you a little bit of a head start here. The person who's genuinely saved in Jesus Christ, they are made new and they have a sample of perfection that is to come. They've been regenerated. They are now alive in Jesus Christ, but it's not fully completed yet. Sin still has its way at times. There's still the battle against the enemy called Satan. There's still the frustration of day to day trying to see the sin gone and the fruit of God's spirit within our lives. So we've tasted a sample of new, but we haven't yet quite feasted on the meal of new that is coming. So what happens is, you know it's coming, and you long for it. You groan for it. So any person who's actually made new, the person who's not made new doesn't groan because they think this is it. They think the world is it, and they don't look beyond. But the genuinely saved in Christ, they are made new, and they groan to be perfected in the things of the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why our sermon title today is, which I really like, I hope you like too, okay, is uh, Made New and Groaning. Made new and groaning. But groaning, we're going to find out, is good. And groaning is right. And groaning is biblical. That takes us to our text right now. 2 Corinthians 5, verse 1. Let's find out what it means to be made new. Verse 1. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. For in this tent we groan, there it is, we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, here it is again, we groan, being burdened or weighed down. Uh, not that we would be unclothed, but that we would be further clothed. That's resurrection body again. Further clothed so that what is mortal, I love this phrase, what is mortal 
may be swallowed up by life. And verse 5, He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit, capital S, Holy Spirit, um, as a guarantee. Okay, so what we're doing right now, we're finding out if we're made new, we groan. What does this look like? Uh, what do we groan for? Um, how is this described within our lives? So here's the first truth I want us to see regarding made new and groaning. Number one is this, is my current tent is temporary. Like, huh? We'll get there, don't worry. My current tent is is temporary. That's why I groan. Again, look at verse 1. For we know that if the tent, which is our earthly home, is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, uh, eternal um, in the heavens. Now, the very first word in verse 1 is, is, is very important. See the very first word there? It's the, it's the word for, okay? Now, what is for doing? The word for is piggybacking on previous truth. The argument is made in chapter 4, which is an amazing chapter, by the way, on don't live for the temporal, don't live for the temporal, live for the eternal, okay? And then it's, it's launching into chapter 5, verse 1. So let's just go back a couple of verses in chapter 4. Look at verse 16 of chapter 4. Paul says, who wrote this, inspired by Holy Spirit, so we do not lose heart. Why, Paul? Well, because of this. Though our outer nature is wasting away, our inner nature is being renewed day by day. Now, this right here is my, one of my favorite verses in the New Testament, okay? And check it out and hear what it's saying. Though our outer nature is wasting away. What's that talking about? It's talking about our, our physical body. Anyone in the room right now aging? Anyone aging? Hands up. Anyone aging? All right, so most of us are aging, and the others, I don't know what you're doing, all right? <laughs> but aging means that outside, externally, we're wasting away. We are getting older, we find ourselves with wrinkles, we have uh, weight moving around, we don't want it to be, we hear creaks and, and pains. It's called we're wasting away. But, but listen, here's the encouraging part, okay? On the outside we're wasting away, but our inner nature, it says right here in verse 16, is being renewed day by day. Now you need to pick up why this theology is awesome, okay? Okay? Every aspect of creation is, 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 is created, lives, but then dies. All the, all the vegetation, all the animals, all the stars in the universe, the whole earth, all the people who live, born, live, but headed towards death. There's only one group, one part of creation that is actually, as time goes on, is becoming newer and stronger and more glorious and more valuable, and the only part of all of creation that actually is being renewed on a day-to-day -day basis are children of God are genuine Christians, are believers in Jesus Christ. Yes, you look at us on the outside, we're wasting away, but on the inside, we, we gotta think about this more often, okay? Like, you wanna grow in maturity in Jesus Christ? You gotta get this stuff on your plate every day. You gotta be thinking about this stuff, man. You can't, if you look at the world and you're focused on the tent, you're done. But if you understand, yeah, I'm getting older, but inside, I'm actually becoming more like Jesus Christ. That is awesome. That is why we live. That is the only, that is our greatest boast. That you can, you, you can take my life and you cannot change the fact that I'm becoming more like Jesus. In fact, if I die, then I start to live. Praise God, hallelujah. That's the gospel, man. That's the gospel, all right? So, so, amen. Clap, 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 clap. Love clapping, okay? Outer nature, wasting away. Inner nature, renewed. So Paul says, don't. Don't lose heart then. You're discouraged right now. Yeah, I get discouraged too. But I read this and I'm like, mm, that helps. That helps a lot. Because inside, I'm actually becoming more like, I, I feel like garbage. But inside, I understand God's working in me. And notice verse 17. For the slight momentary affliction. Okay, so no offense, okay? You and I are here today. We're suffering through trials and pain. Your trial's slight. My trial's slight. Um, your pain and suffering, no offense, it's momentary. My trial, my suffering, it's, it's moment, no offense, it's momentary when compared to the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. You see, so what we do is we're like the trial, the pain, the suffering. Ah, oh, it's so big, it's so big, it's so big. Well, it feels like it's so big, but in reality, it's not. Not diminishing your trial or my trial. Not diminishing it unless we compare it to the eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, then I will diminish it. I will diminish my own suffering and trial. 
See what Paul's doing? Hey, 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 church, don't lose heart, don't lose heart, don't lose heart. Why, why, why? Because Jesus is awesome, and he's made you new, and he's preparing you for an eternal weight of glory. So then, of course, he says in verse 18, don't look at the things that are seen, for they come and go transient. Look for the things that are unseen, for they're eternal. If we focus on stuff that we can touch and money and ourselves, and we just focus on the world, depression. We focus on the eternal realities of glory in Jesus Christ, encouragement, hope, perseverance, passion, love, Jesus. And see, this is the truth that's leading us into chapter 5, verse 1. And Paul's saying is, for we know, okay, ready? Uh, Christian maturity time right here. Paul says, we know, not we think or we hope. He says, we know, we know what? We know, we know that if our earthly tent, tent, earthly body, is destroyed, we know there's a resurrection body that is coming, eternal, not made with human hands, but by God in the heavens. So if you and I want to see maturity, this is, this is a real problem in the church right now, a huge problem. There's a lack of maturity because we're not living for what actually matters. We often live for what moth and rust destroy. We live for wealth. We live for self. We live for material possessions. We live for personal fame. We live for the here and now pleasure of the moment. Give me more leisure. I'll be happy. That's not biblical. That's not, that, that's not going to work. Maturity understands this is temporary. Everything I see, everything I am right now, it's temporary. I live for what's eternal. Listen, listen. There are no spiritual exceptions to this spiritual rule. You cannot be mature in Christ and be so fired up for the world. You can't do it. You can't serve God in money. You can't be so fired up for the things of the flesh and somehow have a passion for Christ at the same time. It won't work. You want to be mature in Jesus Christ? This is the truth we must understand. So in chapter 5, verse 1, Paul contrasts, notice, a tent with a building from God. By the way, when you're reading Scripture, look for contrasts. Like as you're reading it, look for, it's right here in the text, because it brings up the meaning. Paul's like, hey, I got a tent versus a, you know, a heavenly dwelling from the Lord, a, a house made by God. And he also does this. He says, um, he contrasts an earthly home, which is also like the tent, with a house eternal in the heavens, as like the building from God. So one's temporary and one's eternal. So Paul's using the metaphor of a tent to describe the human body, which is kind of neat because Paul was a, Tent maker, right? So he would know the vulnerability and the short lifespan of a tent. The tent was man-made, and the tent is nothing when compared to the house not made with hands, our resurrection body made by God, which is eternal in the heavens. So what we're seeing right here is a window into the secret of Paul's passion. So like, why, why, why was Paul so fruitful? Why was he so fired up? How come he was so effective? Well, this is giving us insight into why. What Paul's saying in chapter 5, verse 1, he's saying, listen, if my human body's a tent and my tent is destroyed, well, that's not so bad because the worst thing that can happen is the tent is destroyed, which only makes way for the eternal house that God has prepared for me and my resurrection body in the heavens. Make sense? He's like, if I lose the tent, but it's just a tent. So if that's the worst thing that happens to me is physical death, that opens the entranceway into eternal life. So he's like, so if I die, then I'm with the Lord. And if I don't die, I can work for the Lord here and get many people as possible that they can find Jesus Christ and then they can have their tents destroyed but then open up life in Jesus Christ in their house in the heavens. Am I making myself clear? Is this making sense? If it is, it's, it's very, very exciting. So, so Paul's secret was, it's a tent. I don't live for the tent. I live for him. And I know that this tent will be gone, and one day real life begins. And that frees me then to not live for the world and not live for this because it's just a tent. It's a tent. If you want to do that, you can go ahead and do that too. It's kind of fun, all right? <laughs> this is what's so exciting then. When the tent is gone, the eternal house of God shows up. But see, this is where for the believer in Jesus Christ, it's for the believer who gets it, it's mind-boggling then to see how much emphasis the world puts on the tent. Think of how obsessed our world is, and if we are like this, that's a big, big problem, okay? Our world is obsessed with the tent. Uh, think of the time um, to dress up the tent, to beautify the tent, to support the tent, to remodel the tent, 
to decorate the tent, to Botox the tent, whatever it might be, right? But the thing is, listen, listen, it's a tent. For the love of God, let's remember, it's just a tent. It's not going to be around for very long. Let's get a picture of a tent here on the screen. Now, I want to say this, okay? This is a nice tent, pretty nice tent. I like the color. I like its shape. It seems to be well-designed. Its uh, pegs are in the ground. It's got a decent foundation. It's a pretty... Now, this represents, in God's Word today, this represents our physical, earthly body, okay? But it's a tent, Now, when you compare it with our resurrection body, this is an insufficient comparison, but it helps a little bit. Here's our resurrection body right here, okay? All right? So, so, so that, but, but, but this, this doesn't do it justice. When, when you compare, um, um, earthly physical body with perfect resurrection body, I don't know what picture you put up here, but it's going to be way better than this too, okay? Let's go back to the tent though. But it's amazing how much time we spend on this. And we're like, yeah, but I like, I like, I like the tent. But it's a tent, okay? And when you have, listen, listen, go back to the other picture now. This, this is not Pastor Robbie advertising and advising go buy a mansion right now, okay? This is a spiritual metaphor, okay? This is representing our resurrection body, okay? The point is, why would you ever live for a tent and worship the tent when this is coming, all right? The spiritually minded person understands, this is resurrection body, uh, ching, I'm in. This is going to be good. Back to the tent. This doesn't have much. But people say, but I like my tent. Look, I, I, I got a skylight, right? <laughs> and, and, and I spend so much time, and I, and I, just, I just love dressing it up, and, and I put all the money in this tent, and I'm so excited. It's because all you see is the tent. Back to the other picture. You don't see this, okay? But this is your reality in Jesus Christ, your resurrection body, man. It's going to be mind-blowingly awesome, right? So the point is, but then, why, go back, go back, go back, why would we live for, for that? If you know that, next one, if you know that, that is coming, right? Why, why would you ever want to live, listen, it's just a tent. It's just, so like the whole point of this right now is, listen, ready? Don't live for the tent! Don't live for the tent! Do I take care of the tent? Sure, sure, take care of your tent, as long as you know it's a tent. Don't worship the tent. So many people are worshiping the tent. I mean, the tent's going to be gone. And then you're left with whatever you have in Jesus Christ. Again, you want to take care of it? Fine. Don't worship it. That's why Jesus says in John 14, Jesus says in my Father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? Awesome. He's there right now preparing. Are you saved in Christ? Are you genuinely saved in Jesus Christ? You know that he lives in you. Jesus is right now, I'm getting your place ready. Amazing. Then he says, I'm going to come back again. I'm going to gather you to myself, he says. And where I am, you also will be. Amazing. Jesus is like, you're mine. Come here. You're mine forever. Come, let me show you your literal house. I don't know. Awesome. Okay, you won't be disappointed. I mean, amazing. And notice the application Why does the Bible talk so much about this kind of stuff, eternity, and thinking of heaven? Why does the Bible talk? Because when we live this way, the verse that precedes uh, verses 2, let's look at it now. The very verse that comes before it, Jesus says, let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God, believe also in me. And then he launches into, in my Father's house are many rooms. See, so we suffer with stress, with with anxiety, we're crippled with worry, we're paralyzed in fear, because we live so much for now that we've neglected what's going to be. But the person who lives so much in the reality of what will be becomes the person so powerfully impactful in the present. See, this is why this theology is not just about, yeah, heaven's going to be great. New heavens, new earth, that's going to be. It's about, it actually impacts right now. It allows us to live the way that we are called to live. And starts with, my current tent is temporary. It's a tent. Now, point number two tells us this, which is so wonderful, that it's right to groan in this tent. It's right to groan in the tent. Look at verse two now. Verse two says, For in this tent we groan, longing to put on our heavenly dwelling. If indeed by putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened, not that we be unclothed, further clothes, resurrection body, that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life, okay? So now what we're learning here, this is, this is very, very important theology again. 
We're learning in this passage, there's so much of this in this, in this whole chapter, there's the already and the not yet. Okay, some of you have never heard this before. There's an already aspect of our salvation, okay? So um, if you're saved in Christ, I'm saved in Christ. We have been saved already. Um, the penalty of sin is not on us anymore. Jesus has taken it all. So we have been sinned already in past. We are being saved. We have been saved. We, 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 we are being saved, sanctification, okay? So there's an already aspect of our salvation, but there's also um, we shall be saved. We are not perfected yet. That day's come. That's the not yet portion of our salvation. There's the aspect of God's kingdom. Jesus Christ has come. His kingdom is now at hand. That's the already. He has come and he has lived and died and he has rose from the dead. The gospel is changing lives across this globe. That's the already. But the not yet of God's kingdom is he will return and perfect it once and for all where Satan is dealt with and sin is no more. That's the not yet. So for the believer in Jesus Christ, there's a taste of perfect glory. We've sampled this meal, but we haven't yet sat down and feasted sumptuously on the realities of perfection where sin is defeated and we see Jesus Christ face to face. Let me just explain this a little bit more. If you're like me, you read these verses and you groan as you read about groaning because you say, it's so, it's so right. It's so true. I think about this stuff like every day. Like it's just so much a part of, of how I focus on the Lord. I, I love it so much because why? If you're like me, you've had a taste and you have seen that the Lord is good. You've tasted the glory of Christ. And when you've tasted him, you want more. So the already is I've tasted him, the not yet is, but there's more to come. If you're like me, you've had a taste of the power and the presence of the Holy Spirit. You've been filled with his power. You've been struck by the glory and the filling of God's presence. And you've, you've operated. That, that, that's the already. But you know there'll be a day where this is perfected. And that's the not yet. And you want, you groan. You groan where it'll be like this forever and ever. Amen. And then if you're like me, you've, you've seen glimpses of the glory of the Lord to the point where the reverence was so strong and the holiness of God was so thick that he crushes you to the ground and you're a puddle of mush in worship for the Lord and you're tasting it and that's the already. But you know there'll be a day where the perfection of the glory of God and his presence and beauty will be on and on forever and ever. That's the not yet. But you groan. You groan for that day when there'll be no more of this temporary stuff if you're like me you've you've savored just enough what it will be like to be rid of sin forever you've had moments where you are living in such a supernatural victory and you are filled with God's Spirit and the fruit of His Spirit's in your life and you're loving the Lord the way you believe you should and you're loving other people the way that you believe God has purposed you to do that and sin is being pushed down and righteousness is on display. You've had just enough of those moments that you say, this is so good. And then you say, but what will it be like when the day where sin is once and for all gone forever and there will be no more evil and no more suffering and no more pain and no more this, no more me fighting against sin sinful flesh, and you sit there and you say, I've tasted it, but I groan for the day that all will be made new and everything will be perfect. Don't you see, this is why the Christian life is often so difficult, because we've tasted a sample, but we know the full meal is coming. So I'm one of those people in my immediate family and my in-laws that when like the big Easter, uh, Christmas dinner, whatever, Thanksgiving, the turkey's being made. I will kind of find my way into the kitchen, you know, because I'm really, really hungry, and I'm the guy that kind of comes over and says, can I just take a piece of, and just put it in my mouth, and just be like, that is so, and when you're so hungry, you taste it, and you're just like, oh, I can't, it's hard to wait, it's hard to wait for when the actual, can we eat now, can we eat now, can we, anyone else like that in here, anyone else like that, and uh, a couple of us good, and then, can we eat now, because you long for it, well, like, that's the Christian life, we've tasted it, oh, it's so good, then you gotta wait, you gotta wait, is it time yet, is it time yet, and you groan, and you long. Listen, listen, it's right to groan. It's right to long for these things. And the question is, are you groaning? 
Like, are you, like, do you think about this stuff? Because if, 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 if the Lord's at work in your life, you should. Like, if you're okay with this world, and you're, you're looking around, you're like, no, man, the world's great. I love this stuff. I want to be here for, what? What, what? what world are you looking at? Not the same one I'm looking at. I see pain and suffering and heartache, and I hate, I hate. Sin ruins everything. You know the amount of situations that come up in this church and just you just see a family destroyed, a marriage ruined, children doing this, then it just, it just the, the pain, the suffering, it's sin. I hate it. I hate sin here. I hate sin here. I hate it the most right here. I groan for the day. It's right to groan. A parallel text to 2 Corinthians 5 and groaning is Romans 8. I commend it to you today or tomorrow or this week. Read it. Romans 8, it speaks of how the creation itself is groaning. Do you know why there's earthquakes and tornadoes and stuff? That's because the earth is groaning. The creation is groaning to be released from sin and decay and bondage. The earth itself is longing to be set free, to be fully redeemed in its purpose of creation. Romans 8 goes on to say, it says this, not only the creation groans, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit, we groan. Why do I get excited a lot? Well, this is why. Inwardly, as we eagerly, because, because if you're going to get excited about anything, get excited about this. If you're going to be passionate about anything, this is why we live. This is the purpose of our lives. This is why we've been created. Notice, we, we long for the full adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we groan for that. For in this hope we were saved. You see, the purpose of our salvation is to be completed. So we groan for the, it is right to groan. It's biblical to groan. Are we groaning? So if you're like me this past week, one morning you woke up and you felt like death warmed over. Seriously, right? You just wake up and you're like, really? Like I remember, I woke up one morning, I had eight different injuries that surfaced at the same time. Now, eight injuries, like four of them I'm aware of from my past playing football and all that kind of stuff, and they kind of come back every now and then. But these other four, like, I didn't even know they existed. And like, what, really? Really? Like, what, wh I didn't know I could feel that kind of pain in certain ways, you know? And I'm not that old. I understand that. A lot of people older than me, but listen, I'm just telling you kind of what's going on. Then you have cold and sickness punching you in the face, right? As you're lying there and you're trying to get up. And then on top of that, the worst is you realize you wake up, oh, yeah, the sinful flesh is still there, too. And the battle of the sinful flesh against the love of God, against the love of others, and trying to get you to do things that will ruin your life. And you're just, you're sitting there. And then I remember, though, the text that was coming this weekend, and I was like, hmm, I'm groaning. It's a whole lot of groaning in one setting. But I realized, yeah, but it's good to groan. It's right to groan. What are we groaning specifically for? Well, on the screen here in our text, the first thing that we groan for right here is our heavenly home. So in verse 2, Paul says we groan to put on our heavenly dwelling. Because again, like, would you rather groan for the earth? Just a quick survey of our world right now, right? So this past week, uh, North Korea, hydrogen bombs, really? Like, really? And then you have terrorists murdering, executing their own mothers, Really? Then you have the economy that's so unstable and all the fragility of everything. And then you have just the society as a whole and just all the pain and police officers shot, all that stuff. And just looking around, just like, live for this? Come on. Really? No, 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 no. No way. We want to we wanna love so much our God and, love, and take as many people as possible with us through the gospel to our heavenly home. It's right to groan for that. Secondly, we groan to be further clothed. This is our resurrection body. We have tasted this. We long for this. We want to put this on. So, so, so just, I, I love doing this, and I'll let you in on things that I love to do. Okay, so, so when you think about that day when you receive your resurrection body, no pain, uh, no weight gain, no disease, no weakness, no fatigue, no suffering, no evil, just no blemishes of any kind whatsoever. These are the bodies that we will receive as children of God. Just, just imagine the day you are in that body of perfection that every time you look in the mirror, you won't be sad, but you look and you'll just be like, this is perfect for the glory of God. So just, to, so just imagine what it will be like to have a body, a physical body, like a physical body like that. Oh, yeah, it's going to be a good day. And you can sense the groaning in the room even now, right? 
Because it's right to groan for this, loved ones. It's, it's Romans 8 just said, it's the, it's the hope that we were saved in. That one day we will receive a physical, glorious, perfect resurrection body. And when you've tasted this, you long for it. So that's why in verse 4, it says, For while we are still in this tent, we groan being burdened. Burdened! You know what burden means? Weighed down. Weighed down. So in a sense, all our weight's been taken off of and onto Jesus. But there's another sense, and this is what the Bible's teaching us now, that because we're still fighting sin, because we still fight Satan, because we're still fighting ourselves, that we kind of feel weighed down. And we walk through life sometimes. You ever feel this way? I do, man, more than I care to admit. And you feel burdened, and you're weighed down in the spiritual battle. But what I'm learning here from this text is it's kind of right to feel that way sometimes. Yes, the weight of my sin is gone in the sense of I'm, I'm innocent, but I'm still fighting against sin for now on the day-to-day -day basis, even though I'm innocent. I'm fighting against sin, and one day, though, that will be totally, but then we, we are burdened. I can't tell you how much I hate my sin. I'm so sick of my sin. It just tries to ruin me every day. I, I, I'm just so sick of selfishness and pride and just the, and just the lust after the flesh. It just want to ruin me. I just, I'm so sick of it. And it's right to feel sick of it because we are to groan and to be burdened, to be further clothed of our resurrection body. We've seen a glimpse of the wardrobe, but we know, man, oh, it's coming. It's coming. So we groan for our heavenly home to be further clothed in this, and we groan for death to be devoured by life. If you look at the end of verse 4, it says where death will be swallowed up um, by life. So we groan and we're burdened. Now groaning, can you hear this? Groaning's not whining. Groaning is not complaining. Okay, so my life stinks and I don't have it. That's not groaning. That's sinning, okay? That's whining and complaining and self-pity. Groaning is, groaning is um, literally a craning the neck in expectation to see. It's, it's, it's on my tiptoes trying to look to get a glimpse of, whoa, it's going to be great. Whoa, look what's coming. That's groaning. You, you, you are long, longing for what is to be. That is the biblical sense of groaning. Very different than whining and complaining. Groaning is an intense longing. Do you have it? Do you have it? Is God at work in your life? Do you have it? Is he working in my life? Do, do I have it? I love it, it says, and, and death will be swallowed up by life. So you know what's happening there? Uh, life says to death, hey, death and mortality, come over here. And death's like, why? And life says, because I want to eat you, okay? And I am going to eat you. I'm going to eat you for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. I'm going to devour you whole to the point that you will cease to exist. This is the power of the gospel found in Jesus Christ. Life will come up and swallow death once and for all, and death will never be seen again. Now that is why in 1 Corinthians 15, Paul says death is swallowed up in victory. This is our hope. This is why we sing loud. This is why we pray. This is why we rejoice. Because we are living in the hope where death has no hold on us. Where is your sting, death? Where is your victory? You got none, man. You got none because I'm saved in Jesus Christ. You are nothing, death. I'm a child of God. I live in him. He is my savior. My hope is secure. I'm going to heaven. There's a place prepared for me. It's going to be awesome. Hallelujah. You can kill me. I will live. You can kill me. I begin to live, really, at that time. Death has been swallowed up in victory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. We love the Lord. That's why we live right now. Relevance. It's right to groan in this time. We groan for this. It's right to groan. So let's get practical. So this week, when you feel body pains and you're really weak, you can turn your body pains and weakness and be like, well, actually, I'm groaning for glory, all right? This past uh, week, I remember I was lying down... Um, to get something under the bed. I kind of, you had to really reach and extend for my wife, and my son was sitting there, and I went to get up, and there's a lot of moans and groans coming up from this guy for whatever reason. Just was really painful to whatever. And dad, my son's like, Dad, what's wrong with you? I'm just like, man, I'm just getting old, and I'm groaning. I was thinking about this stuff too, and I'm groaning. You can, you can turn those moments of like, what in the world to, to, hey, I'm groaning for glory. This week when you are fighting against sin and you're fatigued from fighting against sin, you can change that in your mind and use it to your advantage and say, well, I'm really groaning for glory. I'm groaning for the day when this battle is done. This week when you look in the mirror and you're not so impressed, well, you can, you can turn that and you can say, well, I'm, I'm groaning for glory. 
you know, because we are loved ones, like we are. You can, you can try to fix the tent as much as you want, but it's, it's a tent, okay? Don't you love the people who tell you exactly what they're thinking? I had a few of those come up to me recently in the past couple of months, and so, hey, Robbie, you got a lot of gray hair coming in. Thanks, man. Thanks. Appreciate that. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. I don't really care. I'm kind of groaning, you know. And so another guy, you know, came up to me and said, well, you're really thinning out on top of your head there, man. Yeah. So this is a guy from our church. I'm like, thanks a lot, man. Thanks a lot, all right? Yeah. Thanks for that too, whatever. But listen, listen, I'm, I'm groaning, you know. I remember um, another guy in kind of conversation says, hey, I see your uh, oldest son now can beat you in a race. I'm just like, man, yes, that's, that's true. Uh, I'm gro- Give me a break, all right? I'm groaning. I'm groaning, all right? I remember trying to get up one point, two, in the kind of similar situation. Ah, oh, you look, look, you're a little stiff there and kind of stuff, whatever. And I, Give me a break, man. I'm groaning, all right? This, uh, this past summer, I was up at uh, NBC, Muskoka Bible Center, and I was um, preaching there for the week. And I went down, I believe, as I normally do, um, to pray. And I got down one knee. Now, I, I've had some significant knee problems over here and I had like a bone bruise underneath my kneecap on my femur which lasted for more than two years and I think I might get me on the shore but every now and then it was like this um, massive shoots of pain and you can't really anticipate when it's going to happen but it just kind of happens and it's so painful it kind of buckles you right then and there so I remember kind of praying and the room was there and it was pretty full and I went to finish praying it was like it was like in Jesus name like that you know what I mean so and um and I look at my wife and she's like you know and you and you just you just like what is that man? It's just it's 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 groaning. It's 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 groaning. But I, I'm I'm learning though. There's a sense of that which is like it's it's good. You know, like it's it's good. Why? Because because I've been made for I've been made for another world, and so have you. And so have you. And so we take the fragility and the reality and even the vulnerability of our lives. And we turn it. and We say, but it's not about this. It's not about now. It's about what will be. And in some ways, it becomes very encouraging to groan, right? Because you sense there's even eternity in that. That's, a, that's kind of a powerful way to live. Not whining, not complaining, but you're groaning. And you're saying, man, one day this is, this is going to be done. So you can, you can have fun with that this week. And I hope you remember that for the rest of your life in some way or another. Made new and groaning. We understand my tent is temporary. That it's right to groan in this tent. And then finally, point number three is this. We'll go through this quickly. Um, my tent will be replaced with a house one day, and this is, and this is guaranteed. So, so look at verse five. Verse five says, and he who has prepared us for this very thing is God. Okay, so, so that means God is sovereign. God is in control. God is the one organizing all of this. Okay, so God says, what I start, I finish. Okay, so we are being prepared, even through groaning, by God. God is doing it. He's got your back, loved ones. What he starts, he will finish. And then he says, um, who has given us the Spirit, Holy Spirit as a guarantee. The word guarantee there in the, in the modern Greek is um, engagement ring. So the same way that a faithful man will give an engagement ring as a pledge and a promise to say, I will marry you one day, God gives the Holy Spirit as a 100% guarantee. Think of the marriage supper of the Lamb. It's pretty neat, man. That he gives the Holy Spirit. Do you have the Holy Spirit working in you? I'm not talking like every day is perfect. I'm talking though that it's real. The Holy Spirit of God is in your life. He is changing you, transforming you. There's ups and there's downs, but the trajectory is going in this direction. The Holy Spirit in our lives is God's pledge and promise to say, what I started, I will finish. He says, through my Holy Spirit, you can promise the tent is temporary, man. The eternal house in the heavens, it is coming. And that's very, very exciting. I want to honor two people in our church family who have recently walked from this life into the next. And I want to honor right here, um, some of you will know these dear saints, and uh, Ralph Hag and Mae Turner. Um, they were both part of Calvary Baptist Church. And um, they became wonderful servants of Harvest Bible Chapel Oakville. Uh, Mae Turner was uh, so uh, dear to me. She um, just radiated the sunshine of the Lord through her life. And both of Ralph and May had their own version of groaning. And they are examples for us. Ralph's service was yesterday. May was on Friday. And we're going to miss them. And we, we are sad for them. We are sad in our own sense. But at the same time, um, they were having a very good day. A very good day. They are examples for us right here, okay? So um, they have now traded in their tents. 
their tents are gone, and if they could speak right now to us, they'd be like, listen, listen to the Bible. Listen, listen. Like, don't live for the tent. Don't live for the tent, man. It means nothing. What it, what it, what, what it actually means is, is the glory that is found in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so they, and this, is, this is just reality. The tents are gone, and now they are moving towards the promised, not yet, but the resurrection body that will come when Jesus Christ returns. Oh, let's help us to be wise, help us to live, help us to see what this life is really about. Lord, help us to not be dumb, amen? Help us not be foolish. Help us to love, help us to see, again, what this life is truly about Jesus, Jesus Christ. So let's, let's pray on that, on that level right now. Let's pray. Father in heaven, you are sending strong messages to our church right now. You are communicating very clearly through your word how we are to live, why we are to live, who we are to be. And um, I pray as you call, we are picking up the phone. I pray we are answering. Oh Lord, I, I pray that we are seeing as clearly as ever. Uh, yeah, we're in a tent, but one day, Lord, one day the resurrection body is coming. We have been made new to groan for perfection and completion. And so I pray in a special way, in a beautiful way, there'll be many wonderful senses of groaning here among this church, a longing for you, and then a, a longing to see as many people as possible to join uh, Jesus Christ and be saved. Please, Lord, would you be doing that? As we began this message, apart from you, we can do nothing. And so there's no, there's no real fruit that will come apart from you and your grace. So help us to see, help us to sing now of our future glory and our even present reality. Yes, Lord, encourage your church, encourage your church in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand.